Okay, we're recording. Okay, well, um, welcome to our second seminar of the semester. Um, I'm really happy to have Martin Schall here from uh, the University of Oxford. He's a computer science PhD student in his last year. And um, I got to know about his work already a couple of years ago when I went to a webinar um, presented by Doyne Farmer, who's, um, who's really done some great work in, in general in the, in the realm of econophysics and uh, ecology and sort of a lot of very creative um, sort of points of view on the market. And uh, he was presenting this work uh, that he was, uh, that he had done with Barton and showing some really cool uh, charts that I'm sure you'll see today um, from the person who made the chart. So uh, I'm really excited to have uh, Martin talk about uh, um, market ecology or rather studying market ecology using agent-based models. So uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and I'll, uh, I'll ask them towards the end or, um, or in the middle if it seems appropriate. And um, well, Martin, go for it. Glad to have you. Thanks for having me, uh, Sasha. Um, indeed, as uh, uh, Sasha, Sasha mentioned, um, th this presentation will contain some, some uh, work I did together with my supervisor. Uh, Don Farmer and uh, Ali Karinesco as well, and Mike Waldrich at the, uh, the Department of Computer Science in, in Oxford. So a, a brief overview. Um, uh, I'm going to draw an analogy between uh, the, the world of biology and uh, the finance. And for this, we need some, some common background to, to talk about this. Um, next up, I'll present my model and a set of uh, uh, simulated experiments on, on this model. Um, and from this, we'll, we'll draw some lessons about understanding financial markets in the real world and how we might uh, apply tools from biology to, to real world data. Um, th this talk isn't going to focus much on uh, what the lim limitations are to uh, 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 common assumptions like the uh, efficient market hypotheses uh, that many uh, models uh, uh, built, built upon. Um, instead, uh, I think there, there, there's several uh, main, se several complaints that I have uh, against the, the typical rational expectations equilibrium theory that, that is used in, in the, uh, the in neoclassical finance. And um, th th this mainly has to do with the fact that um, a rational expectations equilibrium demands that all of the, the participants in our market, that their understanding really matches the real world that they operate in. Um, if you look at the finance literature, then th there's more than 300 factor models uh, that have been published and which are claimed to be statistically uh, significant, but uh, we, we don't know which is the, the true one or which, which is the, the best one to use. And in, in practice, if you, um, if you look at what kinds uh, of investment funds operate, then you will find a, a wide diversity of different investment funds. Um, there, there's even firms like Morningstar and, and Lipper who help investors uh, pick the right investment fund for them just because there's such a heterogeneity of different approaches to investing. Um, on top of this, there, there, there are some empirical results uh, that show, of course, that uh, people uh, uh, are bindedly rational in, in their decision making. And so th th there's some biases, they, they, they show irrational preferences. Uh, in some experiments. Um, and finally, um, a, a bit weaker, but still important is um, there, there are simply uh, physical limits on the cognitive ability of uh, retail investors, but also those of fund managers. Uh, so whether it's processing information uh, about the markets or uh, computing the optional, uh, the, the optimal execution strategy to uh, uh, to uh, execute on, the, on those uh, beliefs. Um, uh, there, there are uh, computational limitations on that as well. Um, finally, um, if we assume also that all our opponents are rational and we want to reply rationally to this, this quickly, quickly leads to all kinds of uh, uh, paradoxes. But, uh, um, you probably know this already. 
So um, instead, I'm, I'm going to draw uh, an analogy between ecology and financial markets. And um, it, 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 works, uh, it, it works a bit like this, uh, in that an investment strategy uh, corresponds to a species in uh, biology. So indivi individual investors now, they correspond to individuals of a given species. Um, and the aggregate wealth uh, that is invested using one particular strategy, say, for example, uh, a growth uh, investing, th this now corresponds to the uh, abundance or the, the total population size uh, uh, of the species in, in biology. Um, of course, uh, as these investors, they, they, they incur losses and they make some profits, hopefully. Um, the, the wealth uh, uh, of their spe species changes in time. Um, and this leads to uh, uh, different relative sizes of, of these uh, species in the entire population of investors. Um, and of course, they, they all interact in the, in the same centralized markets. So we, we should uh, be able to observe some interactions between the different species. So we start with uh, a toy model, really, of, uh, uh, of an uh, investment game. So we, we give our agents um, a simple choice. Uh, the first choice is to leave your money in, in, your, uh, in your money market accounts, and you obtain this deterministic interest rate. Um, the other option is that you buy a stock in the market. Um, this stock happens to pay a dividend. Um, and we uh, define a process here, but more or less uh, describes the dividends. Um, uh, it's fairly realistic, other than in the real world, dividends are quite infrequent in here. We pay them daily, but um, the, the tendency for dividends to uh, increase and to, to grow geometric, geometrically corresponds to the real world. Uh, and also uh, the tendency for there to be trends um, is also what we observe in, in dividends. Uh, uh, dividend payments in the real world. Um, so we, we, we give our agents uh, uh, a choice uh, of allocating their wealth uh, between these two options, and this this can be any uh, any fractional allocation. Um, they can also short sell, and they can also borrow uh, in order to, to get a leverage position in in the stock. Um, this goes uh, two very simple accounting equations, namely your wealth uh, is the amount of cash that you have uh, at this point in time, and also the market to market value of your stocks minus any loans that you might have. Um, and the second accounting equation that we have is our returns. Uh, so th th this is a different equation. Um, I'm working in discrete time here because uh, we will move on to uh, si simulation shortly, but th th this should work uh, in continuous time as well. Um, so your returns are determined by the interest that you gain on your cash, but that you also have to pay on your loans. Um, plus uh, any returns on the stock, so changes in the, the stock price of our one time span, uh, plus any dividends that were paid out in this uh, time span. Um, so the, um, the, the pi here uh, stands for the returns, and this will pop up later. So uh, go, going back to species. Martin, small oh, question. Sorry, yes. um, is it um, a very big limitation that there's only one stock, or is this sort of uh, in order? Is this, do, do you think of this as uh, not a very important detail? Um, it's a simplifying assumption in that um, uh, in, the, in the market mechanism that, that I will talk about shortly, this still allows us to find unique uh, uh, clearing prices most of the time. Mm -hmm. If you introduce more stocks, then you get sets of mar market clearing prices. Uh, and so the analysis becomes much more difficult. Okay. Thanks. But um, there's, there's no reason why this shouldn't work for, for many more stocks. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's talk about uh, species. Um, so in, in the neoclassical assumption, there, there is only one species, and this is the, the perfect rational investor. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, there are some object objections to, to this. 
Um, one of it is that people in the market they might have completely different reasons why they're in the, in the market in the first place. Um, financial firms are there to profit from trading, but uh, ultimately consumers, for example, they might enter the market uh, in order to, to, to purchase something that they will later consume. Um, and they, they, they specialize in something entirely different than the trading in the market and said, um, they, they focus their attention on that. And it's only in the market that they happen to interact with different species, namely the market maker and the investment fund and so on. Um, uh, analogous to this in, in biology, we, we have the neighboring habitats and that's it. Uh, uh, a fish, for example, is uh, uh, very much uh, de designed for swimming and, and, and so on. Uh, the, the, the bear uh, uh, interacts uh, with the, the, the fish uh, in, in, in the stream where, where it can try to catch it. But uh, um, the, um, uh, we wouldn't say that, uh, for example, um, the, 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 the fish is somehow uh, suboptimal at, uh, uh, at surviving because it's not as good as uh, uh, surviving these encounters as the, the, the bear is. Um, so um, our, our first axis of uh, uh, splitting a bit the, the strategies in the market is by saying, well, there's going to be a, a group of people who simply come in the market to take liquidity out of it and um, they're not as sensitive to the, the, the price uh, as the uh, financial institutions uh, that operate in this in this market from from day to day. The other reason why we want to subdivide our, our space of strategies is that um, uh, 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 optimizing for something it, 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 this costs, costs energy, and so it may be beneficial to speci specialize yourself into uh, uh, a certain niche. Um, and so, uh, famously, uh, Darwin looked at all the, these finches on the, on the Galapagos Islands and he found that these birds uh, optimized for the, the local conditions uh, in these different habitats, uh, even though they, they, they share a nearby common ancestor. Um, in, in finance, we can also observe this in that there's many value uh, investment funds, there's many growth uh, investment funds. The, the models are quite closely related, but they tend to specialize on different things because in acquiring information and in doing their uh, analyses, um, it is uh, beneficial to them to, to focus on one thing only. Um, so uh, let's put the strategies in, uh, uh, in, a, in a simple form. Um, in this case, the, the strategy will be defined by uh, an excess demand function. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, this form uh, is a form we, we, we borrowed from a classical paper by, by, by Chirella. But basically what's going on is that the, the excess demand uh, of the agent is determined by some, some large term here on the left, um, uh, which, which is the demand part. And on the right, we have uh, their uh, holdings at the previous time, which is their supply to the market. So excess demand is demand minus supply. Um, having this discussed the, the supply, the demand is given by um, the net asset value of the investor uh, times their desired leverage ratio, lambda bar, uh, divided by the price, and this is multiplied by um, a term here saying how much of, the, of their total leveraged wealth they should invest in the stock. Um, the term between brackets here, as you can see, uh, this is going to be uh, bound, bounded. And there's this phi function. Um, if you look at the pa paper, you, you can find all the details, but basically this phi function is what you would call a signal function in investing. Um, if uh, phi is very large, um, you, you would like to uh, uh, buy uh, the stock, uh, then this term will be positive um, and demand here on the left hand side uh, will, will be some large number, uh, which is going to be scaled by your wealth, your leverage ratio and the, the growing market price. 
Um, if your signal is uh, zero, uh, you will be indifferent between the stock and the cash. Um, this term will go to one half. You will, you will split your net asset value uh, between the stock and the cash. And if phi is uh, negative, uh, and, and it is sufficiently negative, um, you will open a short position. You will short sell uh, the stock, leading to negative excess demand. Um, so we had um, a stock paying dividends. Um, and one way to, to split up uh, the, the perfectly rational strategy is to say that uh, one strategy will do only one, one task of uh, valuing this uh, stock. Um, and one task here being uh, discounting the, div the dividends. Um, so we have one value investor um, who's able to uh, uh, discount dividends. Um, the the now uh, uh, required, uh, 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 required rate of return, okay? Um, and they're able to observe these dividend payments and in, uh, in simulation time, they're able to estimate the growth rate uh, on these dividends. And so they're able to make a, a forecast what they believe the, the dividends will be in the future and what, what the price of the, the stock should be at this moment. Um, so uh, it uses observed information. Um, it doesn't have access to the true parameters of the dividend process. Um, so for, for, for this reason, uh, uh, it is already boundarily rational, uh, but also uh, it doesn't factor in the, the trend in the, in the dividends. Um, but again, back into the, the framework of the investment strategy. Um, we, we now have uh, an estimate of what the fundamental value should be. Um, uh, if we uh, take here the, the difference between what our estimate is and what the current market price is, we, we can get uh, this uh, signal, which basically tells us whether we should buy, namely if uh, market prices are below what we think it's worth, or whether we should short sell, which happens when market prices are much higher than the, the estimate of the fundamental value. Um, the other strategy we presented in this model are the, the trend followers. Um, and they're basically able to uh, look at historical prices and extra extrapolate those trends. So uh, our si signal is simply going to be the difference between the most recent realized market price and the one before that. Um, th these types of strategies are often, often called technical trading strategies. And in this case, uh, it's not entirely irrational uh, because of course we had a trend in the, the dividend process. So there, there's a physical trend in the investment. And uh, finally, um, we have the, the noise traders and these are um, the, sort of the, the market outsiders. So these are people that come into the market in order to, to fill, uh, fulfill some liquidity needs, uh, but they're not as sensitive to the price they're paying. Um, so the way we model this is that, um, that if you were to observe these, these noise traders on a, on a short time scale, it may look like they're trading more or less randomly. Um, that they're, a signal is uh, is going to behave very much like a like a noisy process, uh, but on lo long uh, time scales, it's still connected to the fundamental value. And the way we do this is by connecting um, this mean reverting noise process back uh, into the, the fundamental value. So we, we use some parameters that uh, uh, Bouchot uh, and, and colleagues uh, estimate, which is that uh, it takes around six years for for market prices to, to halve their distance to the, the, the fundamental value. Uh, so in, uh, uh, in practice, this means that this mean uh, uh, reversion term here, the, the row, uh, it is quite close to one. So, so th this will revert back to the mean quite slowly. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, the, the market mechanism that we use, um, it's going to be a, a valuation auction. Uh, th there will be a market maker uh, which is going to choose a price such as the, the, the uh, ag aggregated excess demand over all agents, I here, um, is going to be zero for that price. Um, there's some limitations to this. Um, so uh, even in, in one, one dimension, so with one stock, 
Um, th this means that uh, a price is a solution is not necessarily guaranteed, and uh, it's also not always unique. Um, if you restrict the strategies to those that we have, then uh, uh, th this is never really a problem. But in the in the general case for arbitrary strategies, this won't work. Um, th th this makes analytical treatment difficult because we have to deal with th th this multitude of possible solutions. So. What we do is we simulate this. Um, I, I should note, however, that alternative approaches exist, but um, they need some much stronger assumptions, namely um, in another study uh, by Bush's group, for example, they assume that there is uh, a rational market maker who also has infinite wealth so that the market maker can absorb any excess demand that, that isn't met. Um, Another thing you could do would be, for example, to, to simulate a realistic uh, market, uh, such, such as the limit order book. The problem there is that um, those mechanisms are already so, so detailed that it's quite difficult to derive a rational execution strategy. So something that leads to a competitive equilibrium leads to uh, uh, market clearing prices. So in, in, in practice, if you, if you do that, then you find that uh, very frequently, frequently, the market doesn't entirely clear and demand may not be met. Um, nonetheless, uh, all of these market mechanisms are uh, really interesting to look at. And um, so we, we have this software package that we use uh, to, to simulate this, the, these different market mechanisms uh, for agent based simulations. And I will share the link with you later. Um, onto the experiments. Um, what we do in all of the following experiments is if we, we fix uh, an endowment, um, the, the, these are sort of arbitrary numbers, but uh, th this means that uh, our results will be comparable between different runs of the model. Um, initially, we uh, give all of the agents an uh, equal amount of cash and uh, equal uh, uh, dollars worth of shares. Um, the endowment is divided uh, over the, the individuals of different species, but uh, we keep track of the, the relative share that we put between the different species of noise traders, bio investors, and trend followers. And uh, uh, we're going to track this through the discussion. Um, the the, the re relative share is going to be this, this triplet of uh, how much was given to the noise traders initially, how much did the value investors receive at the start of the simulation and how much did the trend followers get? Um, this, this naturally gives us a, a phase space to, to look at our simulation, um, which is a simplex. Um, the, the relative shares, they, they give us these very centric coordinates. For example, the, the uh, coordinates in the bottom left would be the one where the, the noise trader has all of the capital. So the, the, the noise trader here um, would have a high percentage and the other two would have uh, almost uh, nothing. Right here in the middle, the percentages would be 33% for all three of them. Um, what we do now is um, to, to a fine scale, we uh, enumerate uh, all of these possible subdivisions. Uh, so just make a really long list of uh, how we could uh, divide these uh, endowments uh, initially. And then we, we start a Monte Carlo simulation for all of those different initial conditions. Um, we, we then take a run of 200 years for this market. And uh, we're going to look at the, the mean annual return for each of the species. Um, going, going back to the, the, the simplex that you just saw, uh, 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 take uh, every, every coordinate in there. Um, uh, we're going to co uh, color code each coordinate according to which strategy was the most uh, uh, profitable at, at this point. And we then obtain this figure. Um, so uh, the, the, the first thing we observe is that um, uh, uh, for all the strategies, there, there's at least one region where they are the, the most profitable. Um, it, it happens for all three of them to be in a region where they're often not the most abundant. Consider, for example, uh, the, the value investor in blue. It would be most abundant in the right bottom corner, but the region where it's most profitable is on the left, so where it's actually not that abundant. Um, there's also something else going on here. It's 
uh, at the top. So um, uh, since we're doing a, a simulation, we're, we're limited to a finite slice of this, this market. And here at the top, where there's many trend followers, we find that prices diverge from the fundamental. And this leads to massive uh, profits and losses. Um, but it also depends uh, a bit on the, the, the random realization of the, the dividend process and the, the random noise that the noise trader introduced. Um, so th this creates these large outliers that create this, this uh, uh, speckled noise here because at, at a cut of, at, of, of 200 years, um, um, that still isn't long enough of a time span to completely average out uh, some of these large results we have here. And th this is quite, quite a chaotic region. The, the rest of the system is quite well behaved. Um, uh, the system also spends most of its time uh, right here in the middle. The, the, this is in part by uh, design. So we, we, we chose some of the par parameters such as such as this point lies in the middle and this, this unstable chaotic region uh, that this, this is minimal. Um, the second experiment that we're going to do is um, we're starting again from the different endowments, but this time we will allow the investors to reinvest the profits. Uh, and now um, one simulation forms a, a trajectory through this uh, simplex. Um, it's a, the wealth is redistributed. So let, let's take three uh, initial uh, conditions, three endowments. Um, one is uh, the one in red starting over here. This one starts out with approximately 45% um, for the value investor, 50% for the trend follower, and 5% for the, the noise trader. Uh, and it starts out here uh, at the plus sign, and it slowly moves towards this, this uh, central point, which we've uh, identified. Um, but but it, uh, it does so quite slowly. And the same thing applies for these other trajectories. As you, as you can see, um, the, these trajectories are quite, quite rough. Um, they, they fluctuate from side to side and they don't seem to move all, all that fast towards this point. Uh, if we look at the, the 200 gear point, so at, uh, if we look at the cutoff point, um, uh, it also turns out that we're likely to find the system in, in the region around this, this mysterious point here, uh, denoted by the black dot. Um, and uh, th this is the dispersion that the, the, the system has around uh, 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 an attractive fixed point that, that we have identified here. Um, so how do we identify it? Um, the, the way to do this is to go Martin, through um, oh, sure. can I interrupt you one second. Uh, we have a question in the Q and A, um, which probably goes back to towards the beginning, which is how are prices simulated? Is everything uh, basically run through the, ran, uh, the, the normal that you draw it every day, basically, and then it affects the dividends, which in turn affects um, everyone's optimal strategies. Exactly, yeah. So every day, um, the market maker here uh, tries to find this market clearing price, and this is then announced. Um, we have a time, uh, um, we have a time, discrete time step of one. Uh, trading day. Um, in the experiments, we repeat this for, for 200 years, so uh, approximately 200 times 252 times. Mm -hmm. and, um, and these simulations, so uh, ultimately, if you start um, at the green cross all three populations are changing their wealth, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 This is still within the barycentric coordinate system where the coordinate represents the relative wealth of the uh, three investors. But essentially, at every time period, you draw one normal variable, random variable, that affects the dividends and, and that affects the valuation of every trader and therefore the price? Um, there, there's actually two, two in, independent uh, normal uh, draws, the, namely the, the noise trader also has some, some, some noise. Okay. So it's both the dividends and the, and the noise trader that uh, uh, are noisy. Mm -hmm. yep. So um, 
Yeah, for, for this plot, for, for example, the trajectory that you see um, is 200 years. So uh, this does suggest that, that in these regions, at least, the system evolves uh, to this attractive fixed point quite, quite slowly. Um, we will now look at this in, in more detail. So um, we, we do this a, a bunch more times than, than only for, for three initial conditions. And, uh, we again do this as a, as a Monte Carlo experiment in order to uh, estimate the the mean direction where the system is expected to move in um, if you average out all of the noise. So again, on the dividend and the on part of the noise trader, and we obtain these flow lines. So what is clear is again there's there's a fixed point here right in the middle, and there's some chaotic region at the top. Um, there's something else going on, and th this is uh, visible uh, by the, the, the width uh, of the different flow lines in there. And this is that uh, when the trend follower is abundant, or I should probably say when the, when the value investor is, is absent, then the system moves really fast back uh, into the direction of this uh, 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 fixed point. Uh, the, the lines in this region are very thick, and they also move uh, uh, Almost directly uh, to this to this fixed point. Uh, whereas on the other uh, side, so when there is more noise traders or when there is more value investors, uh, these lines are extremely thin and almost disappear here. Um, the, the the units here is the percentage of wealth that, that is being redistributed between the strategies on an annual basis. So so this means that uh, here where the lines uh, are most thin. Uh, every year, there's only 5% of wealth being exchanged between the different species. And so the expectation for the system, even though it might oscillate and sh shake heavily, in expectation, it only moves really slow towards the, the efficient point. Um, so so th th this leads to an inter interesting question. Why would an abundance of trend followers uh, often leads to, to, to massive losses for the trend follower because it looks like when you start out here, the, the system is ejected uh, out, of, out of this region. And so we drill uh, down into this. Um, before we only saw the, the we, we only saw the dominant species, uh, the, the expected returns for the, the dominant species. Um, but if we now plot for different concentrations uh, the returns in the top panel, panel B here. Um, the re returns for both the value investor and the trend follower. Uh, we uh, observe two things. Namely, if the trend follower, uh, uh, the abundance of trend followers increases, so this would be along the x axis to the left. We observe that in panel B, the returns of the trend follower they drop off and they actually go negative quite sharply here. Um, if, if the trend follower decreases, then it becomes profitable slowly and this seems to stop there. Um, contrary to this for the value investor, um, this is the x-axis now in the opposite direction. Um, if we follow the blue line and we move in the direction of more value investors, we observe that the returns also decrease, but they never fall below the risk-free rate of 1% here. So there's competition among value investors, but it doesn't lead to excess losses. There's also competition between trend followers, but uh, 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 large numbers of competition lead to, to extreme losses here. So th this is interesting in that uh, 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 crowding here works differently for trend followers than it does for value investors. Um, on top of this, um, if you in increase the concentration of, of trend followers, in your market, then you're likely to observe higher volatility in your returns also. Um, so so th this tells us why the, the system would move away quickly from trend followers, namely because the, the, the quest uh, unprofitable there due to competition. Uh, but, but that isn't really the, the root cause. And for the root cause, we need to go back to how rational our uh, investors are exactly. Um, so re recall that we put in uh, an autocorrelation in the dividend process, and this was a, a, a positive 
uh, as a correlation of 0.1. If you have a value, value investor who simply applies a dividend, dividend discounting model, uh, so imagine the entire market is value investors, we would be in the bottom right, then the market should also show uh, a, a mild positive other correlation because these value investors are simply translating this other correlation from dividends into prices. Um, so, so th this means there is a fertile ground here for, for trend followers to profit. If we mo move towards the, the equilibrium point, however, the trend follower becomes larger. It starts having a bigger impact on prices and the other correlation in prices starts to disappear. So um, this means that uh, the trend follower is slowly extinguishing its own signal. And if we should pass the equilibrium point, then the impacts that the trend follower has on the market becomes so large that it actually starts inducing uh, other correlation of the, the opposite sign. So it becomes so large that it, it starts thrashing the, the price in the, in the opposite direction. And this explains all of the losses of the, the trend follower in this region. Okay, um, so let's go back to uh, ecology. Um, con consider, for example, the, the hair and the, the snowshoe links uh, both live in, in Canada. Uh, f famously, the, the Hudson Bay Company collected data on uh, appels that, that were collected by trappers in, in Canada in the, in the mid 1800s and uh, uh, early 1900s. Um, and they observed uh, the, the, this curious uh, pattern in uh, the availability of these uh, uh, furs that, that were collected. Uh, this is cyclicality. Um, this inspires uh, um, the Lotka Volterra equations. And this, in biology, um, this is a set of equations that, that are used to describe population dynamics, uh, where populations comprise predators and prey, namely the, the lynx being the predator and the hare being the prey. Um, the precise model here isn't so important, but what is important is uh, the, the following. If we're able to nail down uh, uh, a set of equations that des describe the dynamics of the, these populations. Um, there, there's a tool in biology called the community matrix. This matrix um, is used to uh, make a characterization of how uh, these species interact uh, without, uh, without imposing this on the model. But the way it works is uh, by computing the Jacobian um, of the, the population densities. Um, so basically the sensitivity, sensitivity of um, the population size uh, of, of uh, the, the hare to uh, uh, the size of the, the, the other species, uh, the lynx. So the, 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 what this community metrics tells you is whether if there's more uh, uh, lynxes, will, uh, will the population of hares increase or decrease? And, uh, uh, by, by which magnitude. And in, in any, I think this shows up in, in any uh, uh, ODE course, uh, the, the Lotka Volterra equations. So most of you will be familiar with them. But the important thing is once we have this Jacobian and we look at the, the entries uh, in this matrix, uh, we, we can look at their signs. Um, so uh, if we find a, a positive relation between species, species A and species B, um, so the Jacobian uh, A sub uh, A comma B, um, if this is uh, positive and in the opposite direction B comma A is also positive, one would call this mutualism. Um, otherwise, um, if in both directions the community matrix has negative entries, we would say that these uh, species are competing with each other. But then there's also uh, other types of uh, interaction which are much more rare, by the way. Uh, th th these also have names. Um, and importantly, um, th this characterization and this community matrix, this can be used uh, to analyze the stability of the system uh, under perturbations to the, the population. So how, how do we use this to understand markets? Um, in order to, to build a, a financial community matrix, what we need is the, the average return of the strategy. Um, so in, in theory, theory it is, but um, we, we had our 200 year simulation uh, and our Monte Carlo estimates for this. And what we now want to build is the 
community metrics, namely how sensitive is the the return of one uh, species uh, species I to a change in uh, the population size uh, of another spe species J. Um, so th this is the the financial analog to the the biological community metrics. Um, and we're, uh, using our Monte Carlo simulation, we're able to compute this. Um, suppose we uh, do this linear linearization uh, near the equilibrium point, uh, the, the one uh, marked by the, the large black dots in the, in the previous plots. Um, we, we find the following matrix. Um, the thing that uh, is most important in this matrix is that all the diagonal entries are, are negative. Well, the positive entries are positive. And this means that at the equi equilibrium point, um, uh, the uh, strategy is competing with itself. If you were to increase uh, the abundance of one of the strategies, uh, then um, they would become much less profitable, uh, especially the, the trend follower. Um, if we were to increase uh, any of the other strategies, however, um, the, the, the first strategy I becomes more profitable and these are the, the positive uh, off diagonal entries. Um, so the, the, this, uh, uh, um, um, Robert uh, May's work sh shows us that uh, uh, the system is uh, stable. So um, what we've identified near the center of the plot is a, is a stable attractive fi fixed point average. Uh, around which the, the system uh, moves, uh, but um, it's quite robust against certain changes in the population. For example, if a if a fraction of value investors suddenly were to withdraw from the market, uh, we would probably still guess that um, the market is able to recover and move back to this uh, equilibrium point eventually, e even even if it takes a long time. Um, this. Isn't always the case, however, and um, this is quite quite remarkable for financial systems in that um, if we move away quite far from the equilibrium points, uh, then we find community matrices where these signs flip. So not only do the quantities change, uh, but we also observe that all of a sudden there starts to be uh, a competition between trend followers and, and value investors. Uh, when there's quite a few value investors here, around 55%. Um, so th this means that there is much more going on. Um, the example of the, the links in the hair, if, if, a, if a links encounters one, one of these rabbits, then it's, it's likely to always eat it. In, in the case of financial markets, however, if one fund encounters another fund in the market, um, uh, it might depend very much on the size of these funds, whether they will either compete or benefit from each other. Uh, the, 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 this is what is called density dependence, but um, it, it means that the interactions between the species that, that we've identified is actually more complex, more complex than the, the biological one. In biology, we, we don't expect uh, that if a lynx uh, encounters one rabbit, that it will eat a rabbit, but if it encounters two rabbits, that the rabbit will win. Um, which would be a density dependent uh, effect. Um, in, in nature, it's much more rare than in, in finance. So for the trend follower, I, I would expect a little bit of, um, you know, if think of cryptocurrencies where everybody is a trend follower, uh, you know, and the trend is up. Um, if I'm a trend follower, don't I benefit from other trend followers joining and making the trend even stronger or, is this sort of taking averages over time where at the end of the day, it takes into account the crashes that come out of it um, in, in, in your calculation here? Well, um, I've been a bit sneaky. So in the, in the unstable region um, at, at the top where there's many trend followers, uh, prices actually diverge on, so, so, on, well, uh, non of it, on in human time scales, so on multiple centuries. So in those cases, uh, I think trend followers really benefit from, from other trend followers and that the price will just shoot up forever. Um, in a sort of bubble kind of way, is that the... 
exactly. Is. Yeah. And if you depend on market to market accounting and you don't actually need to consume, so you don't ever have to sell your cryptocurrency in order to, to pay for rent or food or something like that. Uh, yeah, prices might as well go up forever. Um, so th that is quite unrealistic, of course. Um, no, another um, uh, interesting thing is that trend followers on a short time scale, they really benefit from trend followers that are, that are slightly slower than them. Because when the bubble reaches its top, uh, when it loses momentum because people need to withdraw in order to consume, uh, if you're just a bit faster than the other trend followers, you're able to sell at the top or at least not before the price has entirely crashed. And uh, so there's also this dependency, but in this model, we have really simplistic trend followers that, that operate on the same time scale uh, for, for all in individuals. Okay, uh, I have a few more questions. Would you prefer if I keep them to the end or, or do you? Oh, let, let, uh, let, let's go ahead with the, the question. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so we had one question um, that was that was asking, how would you how would you um, represent a passive or an indexing investor? In other words, someone that just buys the you know an ETF and is it is this something you've considered or or? Um... Oh yeah, in, so in in this uh, fr framework um, in, in this valuation setting. One could descri describe a passive fund uh, as a as a fund that has uh, more or less uh, a constant uh, allocation of, of wealth to, to uh, specific assets. So, in in the description of, of trading signals that we had before, I would say that a passive fund or an index tracker uh, or something of that nature would have a constant signal phi, which basically just says al allocates th this uh, fraction of your your wealth to uh, to the stocks. So the, the, it would probably result in a, in a constant uh, here in, in this space. And so in turn, this leads to constant demand. And uh, this also means that in these markets where demand is satisfied by the, the wall ration uh, uh, auctioneer at every time step, that it sort of uh, uh, filled, uh, it, it, you can cancel it out through the, the and I think it just dampens prices. Okay. Ah, so okay. Uh, a higher proportion of indexers would cause, would be more stable rather, like, or it would, it would dampen every, the whole system. It, it would dampen the entire system. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, and I have another question, which is um, from Dominic Sampery. Is the number of agents using each, each strategy accounted for? If there is a large difference, this might introduce instability as when the prey goes extinct. Um, if I understand correctly, is it? I, I, yeah, I, I made some uh, omissions for, for brevity there in that. Mm -hmm. um, when when uh, one of these individuals goes bankrupt, then they're bailed out and the system is reset. Um, so so extinction isn't a, a problem here. Um, on top of that, um, the, the way they're defined, the, the, the way their excess demand function is defined, is that they're aggregable, excuse me. So uh, one fund holding 100 million in, in wealth uh, uh, operates uh, uh, on a macro level the, the same as two funds each holding 50 million each Be because their excess demand functions uh, uh, are summed um, th th these can be aggregated and so their net effects on the on the price is the same mm -hmm. okay so so essentially you have three agents but you could think yeah. of e uh, the trend following agent as multiple people uh, that are following this strategy. Certainly, yes. Yep. All right, uh, that's all I've got for now. Okay, um, so um, moving towards the, the end of the presentation, um, uh, please tell me if, I, if I'm short on time. But uh, um, there's this other cool tool from my uh, ecology that we uh, now can, can do that we that we've computed all of this information. Um, so 
we, we have noted some of the uh, the binary interactions between species. So if species I encounter species, species J, uh, what, what happens? Is there a predator-prey relationship? Do they compete or do, do they uh, ignore each other? Um, in biology, um, if you put all of these relationships together, you, you obtain uh, something called a food web. Um, so this is a network where uh, all of the nodes are the different species and the edges are the characterized interactions between them. Um, and now we, we can uh, ask ourselves, well, um, which uh, species is, uh, well, this food web, this is a, a natural ordering uh, called the trophic level. Uh, and we can ask ourselves which species, species has the lowest trophic level, mean, meaning uh, it doesn't prey uh, on uh, uh, other species, and which one has the highest trophic level, meaning it predates on all of the uh, other species, and it can be said to be the, the, the apex predator if it's at the top. So in order to uh, find this, we can, can iterate the, the following equation. Um, where the, the trophic level of I is one plus um, the dietary fraction. So how often does uh, I, the, how much of the returns of I are explained by the presence of J times uh, the trophic level of uh, J. Uh, J is allowed to be equal to I. Um, th this can be solved through iteration. Uh, all you need to do is initially set, uh, initialize all of these to one, uh, and this converges. Um, the dietary fraction uh, AIJ is simply um, looking at the returns or sorry, the I at a given abundance, at a, gi a given size. Um, uh, how much does J contribute to those returns? Um, I will not, not go through this, but during the slides for, for your reference, it's simply the, the, the fraction of how many of the returns of I are explained by the presence of spe species J. And what happens if you knock J out of the system? What happens to the, the, the returns uh, of species I then? Um, so uh, unlike most of nature, we find that um, uh, the, the traffic levels, again, change dramatically depending on the density. Um, in in the, the system of the, the Canadian wilderness, where the, the, the hare is the, the, the basic food source and the, the lynx is the predator uh, almost uh, always, um, here um, the different trophic levels, they, they change quite a bit. Um, so, so at and um, around the equilibrium point, we find this ordering, uh, meaning that um, the noise trader has the, the lowest traffic level. This is followed by the value investor um, and followed by the trend follower. So what this really means is that the noise trader, because, because it's not really careful about which prices it takes, it just takes liquidity out of the market and uh, it's not too sensitive to, to pricing. Um, it is uh, vulnerable, vulnerable to value investors. Um, who have this uh, uh, interesting dividend discount thing by which they, they, they can uh, better uh, uh, estimate when is the time to buy more and when is the time to sell or short sell. Um, so uh, in this sense, uh, when we say the value investor is a predator on noise traders for, for most of the system. And also uh, uh, for most of the uh, time, uh, for, for most of the region where the system spends most of its time. Um, in the second largest region, um, uh, the trophic levels are undefined. Uh, and this is because uh, uh, they, they happen to be all equal. So there's competition amongst all three. Uh, and uh, uh, one, one could say, for example, that uh, uh, all three of them are predators and they, they each prey on each other. Um, and finally, explaining uh, why the, the trend follower is the, the apex predator. Um, recall that um, it ben benefits from uh, the uh, autocorrelation in prices, and that the autocorrelation actually in the real world only exists in the, in the dividends. Um, the, the trend follower needs the, the value investor to translate uh, the autocorrelation from dividends into prices. So when there's quite, quite a bit of value investors, only then the trend follower can be profitable.
Um, if there's many noise traders, then this autocorrelation doesn't get translated. So there's no way for the trend follower to, to be a predator on the noise trader, um, only on the value investor. And vice versa, there's no way for these other for these two strategies to counter a trend follower when it's uh, trying to exploit this autocorrelation. So um, for most of the region, it will be the apex predator. Um, so now we question, well, um, what can we do with this um, information? Um, is, uh, uh, I, I did already say it before, uh, we sus suspect that there is a connection to the, the price impact that the different strategies have and um, their density uh, affects our results. But uh, let's uh, again look at one final experiment. Um, so we uh, again take one uh, simple uh, trajectory here, starting from the middle, which uh, uh, oscillates in, in this region, uh, as the system typically does. Um, the, the background color here denotes uh, the, the observed volatility in, in prices. Part of. Um, what we're now going to do is um, look at the, the, the market quality. So. Um, the volatility of the, the, the prices on a, on a routing basis um, and the mispricing, so the difference between the, the, the rational model of the, the investment and the actual realized market price. Um, what we're now going to do is uh, build a really simple linear model um, of the, these two uh, characteristics of market quality based on the abundance of the species. So th this is completely contrary to uh, 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 classical finance, where it is assumed that prices uh, reflects all available fundamental information, and so asset price models are based on the fundamentals. So, if you compare this to Fama French, for example, um, uh, this is a, a complete, completely different way of looking at uh, the volatility, the, the mispricing, and the, the returns of the uh, stock. Um, instead, we do the regression on the relative uh, abundance of the, the species here. And uh, using uh, even uh, uh, a simple uh, uh, least squares regression, we, we find a very good fit. So what panel B tells us um, is that uh, using uh, the uh, top model here for volatility, uh, we have an OLS predictor. At the bottom, we have the relative abundance of, the, of two different species. So the, the, the blue line here hovering around 40% means that 40% of relative wealth uh, is with the, the value investor. If we plug this back into our linear model, we get a prediction for volatility. This will be the purple line and orange will be the, the volati volatility observed in the model. Um, so, what, what we find is that this predictor works quite well. So the, 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 the fit is quite good and there's, there's barely any delay between, between uh, changes in the uh, markets and changes in the, in the predictor. Similarly for missed pricing, this also uh, works. Uh, 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 the, the, the fit is uh, slightly less good, I would say. Um, and, um, especially uh, mispricing due to noise traders. So due to um, sh short-term um, uh, mismatches in, in the months due to liquidity taking, for example. Uh, these, it, it doesn't manage to predict, but um, uh, mispricing due to uh, a certain rise in trend followers, for example, uh, it, it doesn't manage to predict quite well. Um, so wrapping everything up uh, is that uh, we've de developed a simple model of heterogeneous uh, agents with a, a bounded rationality. Uh, we looked at bi biology and uh, we have developed some tools um, uh, using the bi biological uh, analogs uh, in order to describe the relations between different types of investors. Um, so when we uh, apply those, we find that uh, the markets uh, actually deviate quite a bit from, from natural systems and that the uh, investments uh, are uh, multi-dimensional in that um, uh, you're never always a predator. You need to 
uh, size your strategy appropriately, otherwise you will still uh, incur losses or become the, the, the prey yourself. And so uh, we, we would say that financial markets are uh, quite highly density dependent. Um, what is useful about looking at markets in this way is that um, we've seen that strategies have different impacts on, on the market quality and uh, on the returns. Uh, and that we're able to, to ca characterize uh, this uh, even using a, a, a simple simple uh, linear model, and, uh, this works quite well. Um, and we would say that um, this approach of working uh, offers an alternative to using things like capham derived models, which uh, uh, which which uh, assume this rationality, which automatically uh, uh, translates fundamentals into prices. Instead, we say, um, if you instead look at the holdings and look at the relative abundance of market uh, activities, uh, then this will probably give you a better forecaster. Uh, at least it does in the simulation. And uh, my next steps are to look at this in, uh, in data in the, in the real world. Um, so that, that's all. Um, feel free to reach out to, to me by email later. My email is in the, in the slides. Uh, and these are some of the important references that, that I cited in the in the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Um, if you have some questions, feel free to put them in the Q and A. Um, <clears throat> in, and we have a a, a, few, a couple minutes. I'll, I'll ask one question. Um, so, especially for the trend following, um, in my experience, trend following is typically something that's done. Uh, on a one month or six month or one year horizon. In other words, uh, you know, specifically when it's multi assets, you know, let's say, uh, you know, uh, a universe of 500 stocks, trend following typically means I take the, uh, the top uh, decile that's, that's performed the best in the last six months and I short the bottom, the decile that's done the worst. And, and often, at least the recipes that I've seen in the finance literature are, are sort of more cross-sectional type of, uh, of definition and, and also on a longer time scale. Have you tried, so it kind of brings me back to a lot of the results you, you have may depend on a recipe or you know, how we define uh, these things to be. Do you think it's very, you know, sensitive to that. So for example, the trend, specifically the trend following ones that seem to be the most chaotic agents in, in, uh, in your system. Yes, yeah, so, so, so what is unrealistic about this model is that um, we put in the trend through the dividends. Um, th th this is mainly for, for parsimony, but um, in the real world, and if, if I read uh, Cliff Asnes, for example, then, um, there's many different fundamentals driving uh, uh, trends uh, in, in real world markets uh, uh, on, on these timescales of, of several months. Um, so the, the, the reason why we're not, well, uh, why we didn't do that is we're, we're simply not simulating the real, real uh, uh, financial reasons why a company's value should appreciate. Um, uh, with uh, a, a trend, whether whether um, a trend in earnings for, uh, earnings, for example, is is likely to continue, um, we're we're not not modeling this, and so the the model is quite artificial in that way. Um, if you want to make it more realistic, then um, one would really need to the the, the the type of equity equity research that people do in practice and say, well. This stock is 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 offered by a business that is doing these activities, and um, uh, it has these earnings. And uh, this model is this model that has a trend is a likely explanation for why these earnings are going to continue for several months more. Um, so th th this would require qu quite a lot of extra step steps to make it more realistic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I thought the trend was just the one step ahead or, or the difference between the price today and the price uh yesterday but in, in 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 this model it is but for real world financial financial markets of course a side effect is, is that there is a complete uh, uh, absence of uh, uh short-term autocorrelation 
Yeah, yeah. As, as, especially in this on the, the one day time scale. So that's... Okay. All right. Well, we have one last question uh, from Spencer Dean. He asks, um, how does this relate to the literature from uh, Lowe and co-authors? So um, I don't know if you've seen the, ah, oh, yeah. Are you pulling up the link? Um, yep. Okay. Uh, yep. Um, so, um, and he, uh, so, so uh, Andrew Lowe wrote this book called The, the Adaptive Market Hypothesis. Um, how uh, this work is different is that uh, I don't assume that the agents are able to adapt their beliefs. Um, th this isn't, isn't to say that I don't believe that people uh, uh, adapt their strategies, but um, by, um, by, by, by how markets operate, typically a fund manager will deposit a prospectus and uh, it will say to clients, we're going to run this strategy um, and there's real legal recourse if you if you deviate from that. Um, so uh, I, I tend to find that even though fund managers may have evolving beliefs and may have di different ideas as uh, time goes on and they, they adapt, uh, uh, the the asset allocation process in in practice is much more mechanical in that uh, the, the, these funds follow uh, something that was outlined in, in the prospectus for decades. Um, on, on top of that, um, many silent facts in markets, um, um, it's sufficient to have zero in intelligence agents. Um, so much of the work I, I, I do is uh, uh, looking at how, how far I can take them, but I, I, I tend to uh, lean towards uh, less intelligence and less adaptive behavior in, in modeling than more. Mm -hmm. However, um, in, in our research group in, in Oxford, the, uh, there are people working on the, uh, the uh, evolutionary next step in, in this ecological thinking about markets. Um, so people apply uh, evolutionary algorithms in order to uh, change, change the parameters to a strategy in order to be adaptive and do belief updating, uh, but also uh, to, to innovate completely new strategies. Okay, Martin. Well, um, thanks a lot. I mean, I, I really enjoyed your, your presentation. We sort of instinctively all know that it's a survival of the fittest, but you, you sort of, uh, your, your work kind of goes one, uh, one step into making this more concrete and, and, and the mechanism is more clear. So, so thanks again for, for presenting at the seminar. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks.